All righty then. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, let us see if I'm sharing. Yes, I am. Does everyone see my screen? Are we good? Yes. All righty. Okay. Yep, thank you. Now, uh, it is now week three, um, August 16th, uh, Monday morning, 1018. We just had our uh, session one of two library sessions uh, regarding uh, plagiarism. Next week will probably be APA format. What's due today, of course, all module two items. I already put grades out. And if I put a zero for you, uh, please investigate that. Um, uh, but uh, I think everyone did, did their stuff. But um, I use zeros as placeholders. Like let's say, for example, you didn't do something uh, in module two, just as an example. It was due 9 a.m. this morning. Well, I'm going to put a zero for it. Now, you, you, you should make that zero go away by posting something within the next three days. Uh, if not, it stays a zero and it's that simple. And I do that so I can keep updated on grades because having to keep on going back and forth on missing blanks is, is, is a pain, especially I have four classes, 60 some odd students. Um, and also uh, a good professor, in my opinion, should keep the student updated. And if the student didn't do something, I know we're all busy. Uh, seeing that zero is usually a, a, an eye opener. Uh, um, and um, pay attention to that. But again, you could sit there and uh, let that zero fester and, and maintain it or do something about it. Because it's okay to be, you know, uh, every once in a while. So right now as a student, yes, you're going to be late for something every once in a while. But honestly, there's no such thing as late, uh, especially in the healthcare career. And those of you who already work uh, know that that is so true. As an office manager, I fired four people for being like a minute late. And my, and my doctor was like, nope. And, go, and I go, she's right there in the parking lot. She's okay. She has this in her life, that in her life. But if you've ever talked to Dr. Lexima, head of nursing uh, for Alexandria, she'll tell you everyone has everything in their lives. Um, uh, you all don't want to know what's behind the door that I lock shut um uh, there's this craziness uh in all of our lives but we're professionals and we gotta we gotta do work we gotta do stuff so what are we doing this week respiratory we did cardiovascular last week and i know the um, the chapters like go out of order a little bit so you gotta kind of pay attention to it some of you already did respiratory stuff so good on you uh if you already did your medical language laboratory chapter four because uh many of you were going in an order like you know one two three four five but last week we went a little bit out of order. We went to chapter five, then to chapter four. But it's all right, uh, do stuff early. That's good, that's good on you. Of course, uh, quiz and discussion forum for next week. And next week's discussion is uh, medical terminology. We know sometimes there are some medical professionals that they use it too much. And there are other medical professionals that use it too little. Um, uh, they, they, don't, they don't speak technically to their uh, patients. So are you part of the camp that feels that medical terminology could intimidate your patient? Or did you feel that medical terminology can uh, um, uh, help educate and make your, um, make your uh, patient feel better? Feel that, oh, I got a pro in front of me. They're, they're speaking, uh, you know, all that technical language. Maybe, maybe they feel a little better. So again, like all things in life, there's probably a little bit of both, but pick one side, pick a side, either one, support your choice, of course, in the proper format, like stated, and it's due next week before the next class session. So that's what's due, get that out of the way uh, for next week. Now let's go to chapter four and let's talk about the salient features of uh, chapter four. Uh, where's my medical language lab? Here it is. I'm going to go right directly to my ebook. Now, respiratory, chapter four. It is a de department of pulmonology, which is a. Uh, why is it not coming up? What's going on? Hello. 
Okay. Um, it is part of the uh, Department of Pulmonology, right here, also known as pulmonary medicine, which is a subspecialty of the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, so, you know, when they call the doctor an internist, you finish four or five years of residency in internal medicine, and then you do like two or three more in pulmonary medicine, and then you get your lovely fellowship, and then you can charge $300 for every 30 minutes of your time. Um, so these are pulmonologists, they're MDs, and they do a lot of things dealing with you have the upper respiratory tract, which is everything from your trachea or your windpipe on up. And then you have your lower respiratory tract. Now a URTI or an upper respiratory tract infection, like maybe I had an infection in my nose, rhinitis. Maybe I had an infection in my throat, pharyngitis. Maybe I had an infection or inflammation of my voice box, laryngitis. There's, there's recent things, but um, they're not gonna land you in the, uh, um, it's not going to land you in the um, ICU. They're annoying things. So URTI, it's of concern. Now we get concerned when that infection starts going south to your windpipe, trachea, hence tracheitis, and to your uh, little tubes here, your bronchioles, bronchitis, right? So you, right off the bat, we have a whole bunch of itises. You have an upper respiratory tract infection, lower respiratory tract infection. Other examples of a lower respiratory tract infection are emphysema and oh, pneumonia. Now emphysema, pneumonia, chronic bronchitis, and we mean chronic meaning it takes a long time. Let's look at that word, chronic. Of course, ick is the suffix and it means pertaining to. That means this is an adjective. Crone is the root, and it means uh, time. So it's pertaining to time. If you have chronic bronchitis, that means you've had those symptoms and those problems, inflammation or infection of your the tubing of your lungs for weeks to months, and that's not a good thing. Versus the word acute, and acute means it's sudden. Uh, there's no way to break that thing down, but uh, it just happened right now in the last 12 hours, in the last 24 hours. You could have also acute bronchitis, right? A lot of phlegm buildup since uh, Friday night. By Saturday night, you're wheezing, have uh, dyspnea or difficulty breathing. Okay. This is also known as SOB or shortness of breath. Dyspnea means uh, difficult or uh, painful or abnormal breathing. And sometimes you'll see this uh, SOB. So you could have acute bronchitis. You could have acute dyspnea. So these are some common things that, uh, that you'll see. And remember, what are the two things that you need to know for the upcoming midterm in about two weeks? I could ask you, what's the part? Like suffix, root, or how this? What's the part for, uh, what is, how's this question? What is the combining form of the medical term chronic? Is it A, prone? Is it B, ick? C, O? or prone, oh, take a second for that. What do you think? D. D, correct. Because what is a combining form? It's a root plus a combining vowel. And this is a classic kind of question, which by the way, this question right here on last, uh, last term's midterm, this kind of question in here was the one that was most wrong. But the uh, class average pretty much for this, this class for uh, midterm and final, it's pretty good. It's in the 90s, like 91, 90, it's pretty good, right? So look out for something like this. Do you think you can do that for each and every word that you, that you get exposed to? Sure. You could, if you figured it out, all, all the words, maybe do like uh, 
like 10, 20 words a day, you could figure it all out by in the next two weeks. Here's your main stem bronchus or tubing of your lung. And then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller to your bronchioles. Your bronchioles are connected to these bunches of grapes called your alveoli. Alveolus, if you remember your singular versus plural, that means one little air sac right here. But an alveoli is a whole bunches of grapes uh, because alveolus in Latin means grapes. And alveoli, a whole bunch of grapes. And it kind of looks like a bunch of grapes. And this is really important because this is the area of your capillaries where you have gas exchange. So now if you understand that this little area is here at the ends of your uh, bronchioles or the tubing of your lungs are very important for gas exchange. This stuff up here, yeah, you can still breathe, right? Unless, you know, this thing gets blocked off and that's never a good thing. But imagine if you had pneumonia, bronchitis, emphysema, or any of that down here, it's going to affect this and then you can't breathe. And you'll get dyspnea or SOB, shortness of breath. Oh, you could also get these things as well. Remember we discussed this last week? You can get tachypnea, you can get bradypnea. Tachypnea, fast breathing, fast rate of breathing. And of course, bradypnea, slow. And remember, if you have two things, memorize one like your life dependent on it, and the other one is pretty much. Uh, me, I always think tacky. Tacky means fast. Um, when something's tacky, it goes out of fashion pretty fast. So fast rate of breathing. Let's look at some upper respiratory tract terms. You have your adenoids. Now, oid means resembling. It's a suffix meaning resembling. Aden means gland. We kind of uh, learned that from the immunology chapter from last week. So it's not really a gland. It looks like a gland, but it's actually your adenoids are part and parcel of your immune system, just like your lymph nodes and your lymph vessels. Sometimes they get infected, so we got to take them out, and that's an adenoidectomy. Your voice box versus your throat. You could have laryngitis versus pharyngitis. Pharyngitis, sore throat. Laryngitis, um, that's when you can't talk. Um, um, so we can have to scope you sometimes. I have to order a laryngoscopy and they use the instrument called the laryngoscope to look at your voice box to see what's going on. Especially if your, uh, your you use your voice professionally, um, then this becomes a concern. Nose, nasal, al, pertaining to your nose. Rhinorrhea, remember rhinoplasty we talked about? Nose job, plasty means um, surgical repair. Rhinorrhea, watery discharge from your nose, right? Um, also known as post-nasal drip. One of the most common uh, diagnosis codes to know is rhinorrhea. Um, especially if your patient comes in with a common cold and, uh, you know, you want to get that diagnosis code out, you want to get paid. Tonsils are just like your adenoids. They're part and parcel. I love saying that. Part and parcel of your um, immune system. So if you see any peritonsillar or uh, redness or inflammation, um, inflammation or infection around the tonsil area of your mouth, and let me show you a picture of your tonsils. Okay. Oh, here's one. Your tonsils are the thing on the sides. And they can get inflamed or infected like this thing. Look at that. This is, of course, your uvula. Look at here. Here, too. And the bridge of your soft palate is not good. This is your uvula. That's the rudder that steers um, food down into your, um, uh, into your esophagus, right? Now, this part, see, is not too bad, but ooh, look at this. See that, that those little white and the pus-like structures there? Not good. Great teeth, by the way. 
love I love some of these pictures. Um, we mentioned pharyngitis, which is a sore throat, peritonsillar area. You got to look at that area, especially. Um, and again, nowadays, mask up, glove up, put your uh, put your um, visor on um, or a face shield. I used to call it visor or face shields. Um, your trachea, which is your windpipe, that's where the air goes into from the outside world into your lungs. Um, now, if all this gets blocked off, I have to create an opening, also known as a stoma. Hence, the term is called tracheostomy. First, I have to perform a tracheotomy, which will make Tomy to cut. Then I put in a stoma. So, uh, which is my last patient that I had to do that um, one of the first times I ever did one was uh, EMS. It was really interesting. The guy was running around in 59th Street near Central Park and in New York City. He was running and a bee, he was allergic to bee stings. While he was breathing, running, jogging, the bee went in here and bit him back here in the, uh, in the oropharynx, right here. Then this all swelled up and this closed. Now that's danger, danger, because now air can't go in, either through his nose or through his mouth. So of course we call, um, uh, I, I can't even get a, um, um, a blade in here to, to go open it up. So uh, the ER doc, uh, we, were, we were very close to the hospital, not even three blocks away, but of course, New York City traffic or whatever, the emergency room uh, physician said, you're gonna have to perform a tracheotomy. We have to cut into here, and then we have to create an opening, and that's called a tracheostomy. I have to create a stoma so that the patient can breathe. It was really interesting because he was panicking as all heck because he knew what, he knew what the heck was going on. He knew what was happening, and that's a rough, rough thing knowing that you, you can't breathe. Um, so that's a uh, – where are we, where are we, where are we? too far down. So that know the difference between a tracheotomy right down see how close they are and look at the differences of the suffix tomi means to cut stomi is the process of uh, placing a hole or a stoma. Okay. Stoma is like a hole or an opening or a mouth. And, and which is, well, that's all what, so if you have stomatitis, that means you have inflammation or infection of your, 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 uh, your mouth, stoma. Um, okay, let me back this up mouth or opening okay but it looks really close doesn't it don't you could don't you think i would do something like that or try to trick you yep i would no professor oh. yes go ahead you go back for, um so for those two words that look similar right and if you were to ask a question uh, on the upcoming okay. exam how would you break down the uh the root word I mean, the combined form. So the how's this? One, uh, let so let me give you some questions. Let's see if you can answer them. Um, uh, the doctor had to create a hole in uh, the patient's uh, windpipe. Which of the following is the most appropriate term? Blah, blah, blah. Right? So A, tracheotomy. Tracheostomy, both, neither. B. It would be B. Because stone <laughs> means hole, means mouth, right? Now, could I change it to a uh, uh, doctor had to make an initial cut? It's going to be A. It's going to be A, right? Uh, how's this? Uh, uh, which of the following? Uh, Terms has the root word uh, windpipe. 
And it would be what? Both, right? And to break it down, both of them have what? The root, trachea, right? But they have different suffixes. Tracheostomy has tomy to cut. Tracheostomy has stomy. So don't you think that could be another uh, question? It goes in the word tracheotomy, what's its root? What's its suffix? In the word tracheostomy, what's its root? What's its suffix? And that's how you can break down every word. And also that's how you could see how uh, the test could test you on, uh, um, can you look at attention to detail? Because I've had this exam, I've had this on exams, on, on in-campus exams, and I've had students raise their hand. It's the same word. And I go, really? Okay. Because remember, attention to detail. But that's how you break it down. The, uh, does that answer your question on how to break it down? Yes. And how to differentiate? And then look at the ones, especially in my notes that I put, that I put together. I put mm -hmm. together on purpose because uh, they're, they're words that are most commonly swapped out. Like, for example, and especially if you don't know the difference between the two, and eventually I cannot guarantee that you will not be doing some administrative work. And one of those administrative things that gets always messed up is diagnosis codes. And the tracheotomy versus the tracheostomy, they're two entirely different price ranges. And your surgeon will be very, very upset if you pick the wrong one. And I've been, I've been on the, uh, I've been on the operating end of a, of a good, good tongue lashing uh, on how many times when I was an office manager slash medical biller how many times I've, I've made, I've made diagnosis codes that were really, really close, you know, in medical terms that were really close. And, and uh, it cost, it cost the office thousands. And you learn really early that you have to be specific. Now we mentioned the bunches of grapes. So that's your alveolar uh, uh, area, right? Also known as the conducting zone, where you actually do the breathing, where there is actual gas exchange. And that's your alveolus is uh, singular. Alveoli is plural. Don't you think that could be a singular versus plural question? Yep. Bronchus, singular. So you could have the right bronchus or the left bronchus, which is the, uh, the main uh, tubing that comes right from your trachea or your windpipe. You got the right one here, it's short and fat. And the left one here is a little bit longer and thinner. So you have right and left bronchus, or I could say both bronchi. And we could have bronchiectasis. Now bronchiectasis is the exact opposite of bronchitis. Bronchitis is inflammation or infection of your, uh, your, the tubing of your lungs, but everything gets all clamped down and tight. In bronchiectasis, the exact opposite happens and it's dilatation or expansion. Now, uh, just for completion, just know that your body likes being in the middle. It doesn't like also being all puffed out like that. And we'll show you in both pathology and your anatomy and physiology one class, why bronchiectasis is not a good thing to have. It's typical in COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, specifically in emphysema. The, you know that um, disease of smokers, which by the way, anyone here smoke or used to smoke? Uh, I smoked for about 12 years. Uh, smoking when you stop smoking it's a good thing but uh, your risk for cancer still remains even if you smoke one year versus even 12 years but the risk is still there now what's one way we could see if there's anything cancer going on I might have to just look right down um, uh, uh, right down your lungs I use the instrument called the bronchoscope and I, um, I order a bronchoscopy, okay? We could also have bronchiolitis, inflammation or infection of the bronchioles, which is part and parcel of bronchitis. I better stop saying that, it's getting annoying. Your pleura is the covering of your uh, uh, lungs and you could have what they call pleurisy or a pleuritic rub Pleuritic means pertaining to that covering. Let me write some of these terms down. 
because they're clinically relevant. You'll see that when you're in your med surge classes. So you have this thing, pleura, which is uh, the covering of your lungs. Now, if they get infected, you'll get pleuritis, which is inflammation or infection in the covering of your lungs. It's easy enough. But then you get this, uh, like those of us who ever uh, had, you know, really bad bronchitis or really had a really bad cough or cold. Do you guys remember that like every time it coughed, it felt like a knife, very, very sharp pain in your sternum or your breastbone every time you coughed. And that's called pleurisy. Pleurisy are also called pleurodynia. Pain in the covering of your lungs. It's all because of the pleuritis. So if the if you have inflammation or infection of the covering of your lungs, your lungs are covered with a whole bunch of nerves and you'll feel it and it's painful. Um, and it's one of the many reasons why we give cough suppressants, not really because we want to suppress the cough, we want to suppress the pain. So pleuridinia, pain in the covering of uh, your, uh, your lungs. Pleurisy is the same as pleuridinia. And it's all because of pleuritis, your suffix, itis, your root, pleur. Pleuralgia, look at there. Thoracodynia, that's also uh, the thorax, a pain in your chest. But thoracodynia could be anything. It could be angina, which is um, cardiac chest pain due to exertion, right? That's not a good thing. If you, if you ran up the stairs and your chest hurts, go see your doctor ASAP. Or, you know, if you do something strenuous, you get a little dizzy and maybe a little bit of chest pain and it feels like indigestion, go see your, um, go see your physician. Um, atelectasis, di dilatation or expansion of your alveoli. Again, uh, that's emphysema, that's not good. It's a signal that your alveoli are falling apart. You could also have the sign and symptom of cyanosis, which is a bluish discoloration of your skin. Osis, abnormal condition, meaning away from the rule. The rule is I shouldn't look blue. And for people of color, you look more ashen. You know, uh, if you've ever seen um, um, uh, a dead body of some of a person who, who uh, you know, was uh, uh, melatonin and, uh, you know, had some have some color to the skin, they look kind of ashen, uh, kind of grayish or bluish grayish. And that it means is there's uh, definitely a deficiency of oxygen in the blood. Now, the way we confirm cyanosis, someone could look cyanotic, but the best way to look at it is um, you uh, flip over their tongue or you look inside uh, their eyelid and you could do that at home. You will see that it's very, very, it's very, very pink and very, very full of uh, uh, blood vessels. But if my patient is experiencing cyanosis, they not only will look like that on their skin, when I start looking at inside their tongue or inside their eyelids, uh, you'll see uh, a lack of uh, uh, discoloration as well. Anosmia is a state or condition of no smell. Uh, nine times out of 10, it's usually some sort of obstruction. But if there's no obstruction, Ooh, and it's not temporary, uh, we're thinking that it's a neurologic problem. Hypoxia. Hypo means decreased. Oxia, state of condition of oxygenation. So let's look at that word because that's a little tricky, especially for test time. So let's look at the term hypoxia. Hype is the prefix, which is like hyper. I mean, no, hypo, sorry. Which means uh, deficient or decreased. Now the root is ox, which is weird. And of course means oxygen, also O2. And the two is written like this. Uh, 
and then uh, let's take this out, and then of course ia, which is the suffix, and that means state or condition. You could have an axia, and would be the prefix, meaning no or not. That means my patient is not getting any oxygen whatsoever. And of course, the more rare uh, uh, hyperoxia, that's not really a word, but you have hypoxia and anoxia. Anoxia, no or not. That means they're being associated. There's no oxygen going in or out. Um, and hypoxia, that means deficient, okay? These are nice, some nice words that complement each other. Do, 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 do. Phagia, aerophagia. Phagia means swallowing or eating. Dysphagia, abnormal or painful eating. <coughs> polyphagia, poly means many, right? So if you have polyphagia, especially with uh, newly diagnosed um, diabetic patients, they eat a lot. Uh, more than they should. We've discussed dyspnea already and apnea. Apnea means absolutely no breathing. That's not good, right? If it's more than six seconds, uh, start CPR. But honestly, don't wait six seconds. You, you could tell it's time, to, it's time to start moving. Now, wherever you have a muscle, you could have involuntary contractions or twitching. So you could have a pharyng uh, pharyngospasm in your throat. And of course, that's not good. That's not good for swallowing. That's also sign and symptom of dysphagia, potentially a neurologic problem or a GI problem. Pyothorax, pyo, pus. Accumulation of pus in my thorax. Now, what is pus? Pus is not a good thing. Anytime, so pus is white blood cells, well, dead ones necrotic plus other necrotic tissue or dead tissue is um, um, bacteria or foreign body. And of course, necrotic as well. Necrotic means dead. That's why you got to get rid of pus because the more dead things you got in your body, it's make, it sends a signal to the, all the surrounding viable tissue that, hey, time to die. And that tissue is, uh, will also die as well if you don't take care of it. That's why when you have a pussy wound, you gotta clean it out, clean it out very well. Because in a battle, what do you have? You got the good guys, white blood cells, and you have the bad guys, pathogenic bacteria, bacteria that can give you disease, right? And uh, they accumulate enough, all the dead things becomes pus. Um, and pyothorax, not a good thing. Uh, it means I could have pus in the covering of my heart, which is the pericardium, or I could also have pus in the covering of my lungs, which is your pleura. Either, either situation is no bueno. You don't want to be there. NG tube, nasogastric tube. If you look at that, and uh, not cooperating. If you look at the word nasogastric, Ick pertaining to um, the root naso or nase, right? Which is nose, gaster, which is stomach. So it's a tube that I'm gonna insert in your nose and I'm gonna, and I'm gonna push it all the way down so it'll go to your stomach. And we use that for, uh, we put meds and stuff or it could be a feeding tube or we could use it for activated charcoal. Like let's say um, uh, somebody tried to kill themselves and and ate like a, like 100 Tylenol pills or whatever. Uh, we pump out your stomach that way. And also we put um, activated charcoal to soak up all the, the poison. Uh, and I mentioned that one of my last pediatric patients uh, uh, that I recall, maybe not one of my last, but I remember distinctly, uh, she, she ate something like, she was depressed over girlfriend, boyfriend, who knows. Uh, and uh, she was depressed and uh, 14, 15 years old. And she took like a hundred uh, uh, Tylenol pills. It won't kill her, but it made her really sick. Uh, but we had to pump that all out. So I had to insert an NGT, NGT, which is nasogastric tube. 
pharyngo, uh, pharyngoscope, pharyngoscopy, we already talked about that. Nose, nasal, right? We already talked about that. Ooh, para means near, beside, or beyond. So your paranasal sinuses. So those are your sinuses or spaces in your skull that are right next to your nose. That's why when you get sinusitis, inflammation or infection of your sinuses, uh, that's when your head feels like a bowling ball and you start talking like this because you're all stuffed up and gummed up. Rhino, naso, we already talked about that. Oh, look at here. Here's your maxillary sinuses. You also have your paranasal sinuses here. Here's your sphenoidal. And uh, your sphenoid is uh, part of your bone here on the uh, side of your head near your temple. And you have your frontal, of course, it's on your frontal bone. Someone gave this kid a bad haircut. But hey, if you get sinusitis, all this gets filled up with fluid. Your head feels like a bowling ball, very, very heavy. Uh, you get very, very congested. It's not fun. Rhinorrhea we talked about, aphasia we talked about. Hydrotherapy. Therapy, of course, is management. What are we going to do? And hydro is water. Hydrotherapy is mentioned here because that is the number one thing to promote a good cough reflex. Coughing is good. It kicks up all that nasty mucus that has all the yuckiness of back pathogenic bacteria, viruses, and even um, a, a foreign body. So we promote that. And, we, and also when you're coughing, you expel a lot of water vapor and, the, and uh, your very young, very old patient can get dehydrated quite quickly. Uh, pharyngomycosis, pharynx, throat, pharyngo. Now, myco means fungus. Osis is an abnormal condition. And just as a quick primer, there's no such thing as bad bacteria, good bacteria, bad uh, fungus, good fungus. There's just fungus and bacteria in the wrong place and in the wrong amounts. Uh, right now, you got fungi all over your body. Fungus, singular. Fungi, F-U-N-G-I, plural. Again, another beautiful singular versus uh, plural question. Back to what I was always talking about is uh, active learning. When you hear certain key things that I say or your future professors, because I know this, this, this is boring. This is not exciting. It's not like watching Netflix, right? But you have to start picking up stuff. So this is another potential good, uh, good question. So my patients, pharyngomycosis, they have a fungal infection. We're going to have to do about that. It's osis. It's an abnormal condition. Al pertaining to ab away from the prefix. Ab is away from what? The norm, the rule. The rule is I shouldn't have any fungus in my throat. But there are some times, but when it gets out of hand, I have a pharyngomycosis. Um, doo -doo 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 there's just another picture. Oh, by the way, lovely, lovely pictures for anatomy and physiology. Hint, hint. If you're in my anatomy and physiology, I actually use some of these pictures. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. seal that means a hernia. So, if I had a pharyngo seal, I have a herniation or a swelling, an outpocketing of my throat, and that's not a good thing because it's going to cause dysphagia and I'm going to have some breathing problems and swallowing problems. Pharyngostenosis, well, of course, another bad thing. Um, your throat starts, uh, starts closing up. In the case of the guy, the jogger guy uh, with the bee that stung him in his throat, oh, it got stenotic really fast. Uh, it was like minutes. And then he was wheezing, and then the next thing I know, uh, he wasn't breathing. It wasn't it's kind of scary. But I'll remember him for forever because uh, when we gave him uh, the uh, EpiPen and, uh, you know, um, uh, and then um, I properly performed the stoma, uh, he was looking at me and he was breathing. And um, I didn't know if he was angry at me for cutting up his throat or whatever. But when all was said and done, when, uh, when the surgery, when surgery patched him all up, uh, he was released uh, later that day. Uh, it was really cool. He found... He found me and my boy, Julio. Uh, he's my driver. You'll always hear stories about me and Julio. Um, uh, 
uh, he gave us he gave us all a big hug and you know it's one of these rare things when people actually say thank you uh but um, the look of fear and slash anger in his eyes i thought he wanted to sue me but hey just doing my job gotta cut a hole in your throat sometimes laryngostenosis that narrowing stricture of his uh uh not uh pharynx up here this is voice box now how do you know someone's choking they can't speak uh some of you have taken cpr and they do that thing where oh the universal sign of choking is someone putting their hands on their throat no it isn't they're panicking and they're totally wigging out and they're totally freaking out and you're and then if you see that they're trying to say something to you and nothing's coming out that is a clear indication your patient has a blocked airway do something about it uh chondro that's the cartilage in your ribs uh well anywhere that's cartilage um uh costochondritis let's write that word down nice word Suff uh, uh, itis is the suffix. We already know what that means. If not, I should fail you right now. But everyone's good, right? We know what it means. Inflammation or infection. Then, of course, cost is a root, and it's your ribs. Condor is a root. And you have this combining vowel that's connecting these two roots. And condor means cartilage. Because your ribs aren't all bones. There's part of them that are cartilage so that your chest can expand a little bit when you breathe, when you inhale. So that's costochondritis. Pleurisy is a nice signal that this is about to happen. And when they have costochondritis, you're definitely going to have SOB, shortness of breath, dyspnea. And it's painful. Ugh. A costochondritis. Uh, because the pleurisy then spreads not only to your sternum, it starts spreading to the sides. Ugh. It feels like if you've ever had a really bad cramp, oh, that's what it feels like. It's awful. I do not wish any pathology over people. Oh, here's the beautiful stoma. But this time is one of a, this looks like a Stelgetti from the Golden Girls. And here you go. Epiglottis. Epi means on top of. The prefix that means on top of or superficial. Here's your epiglottis. Here's your esophagus or your food tube. It's an expandable tube that goes here. And here's your trachea that has cartilage right here. Your trachea, when you're talking, the epiglottis means open. But when you're eating or drinking, the epiglottis will shut this and nothing should go in your trachea so that this now can expand your esophagus or your food tube. So, you know that thing that your mother or whoever took care of you? Uh, um, what do you call that? Would say to you, like, oh, don't talk when you eat. Don't, talk, don't try to talk when you're eating or drinking because you could confuse this epiglottis and start choking. It is also the reason why we put a tube in here when you go into surgery, because I want to not only control your breathing, if you vomit, I don't want anything to go down here other than air. And that is also the job of the anesthesiologist. Let's look at that word. See, every single word begets another word. So let's look at logi. That's the suffix. Means, of course, study of or department of, and is the prefix, that means no or not, esthesi is the root, means feeling. So you put it all together, it's the study of no or not feeling, and that's what the anesthesia, that's what the anesthesia does for you. You should not feel anything, and also you should not uh, you should not remember anything either, hence the term amnesia. Ia, state or condition. 
goes uh, a means is the prefix, which is no or not. Nizi is uh, the root. And that means memory. That's why you have words like mnemonic, you know, pertaining to memory, pertaining to memory games, whatever memory you can have to get all this stuff in your head permanently. Remember, grades are one thing, actually knowing stuff in the real world is totally different. Uh, I also wrote carbon, I wrote, wrote oxygen. This is what our O2 looks like. This is what CO2 looks like, carbon dioxide. You breathe in oxygen and you breathe out CO2, which is its byproduct, which is our waste product, carbon dioxide. Which by the way, it's nice to have plants around because plants do the exact opposite. They take in carbon dioxide and then kick out oxygen. Uh, da, 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 da. Pneumo means lung. So if I had, Pneumonitis, inflammation or infection of my lung. Pneumonectomy, I'm taking out a lung or pieces of the lung. Pneumonia, state of condition of your lung. Now, what does that really mean? When pneumonia, when you get pneumonia, it's okay for your lungs to be moist. It's not okay for your lungs to be dry or to be super wet or have a fluid level in there. You'll be drowning in your own tissue fluid. And that's what pneumonia is. And it's awful. Uh, any of you who've had pneumonia, you know what I'm talking about. I haven't had it in like three or four years, but three years ago, ooh, three years ago, it was awful. Seal, we talked about that. Here is a lobectomy. There are lobes or sections of your lungs. We can, uh, if you have cancer, we can just take a piece of your lung out. But if I'm doing pneumonectomy, I'm taking out the whole thing. And we can, and we can do transplants and all these other things crazy things nowadays. So know the difference between a lobectomy and a pneumonectomy. A lobectomy only takes what? A little piece or one lobe, one section. But a pneumonectomy takes the entire lung. So this is a lobectomy of the upper lobe right, and this is a pneumonectomy right. Remember, when you're looking at your patient, this is the right side, this is the left side. Uh, where we went to that, we went to that. Chlorodynia, we went through that. We went through that, that's good. Pleuritis, algae, and dinia, we went through that. Brady, tacky, we went through that. You, we went through that. Even though they don't use this you too much, but it is a word. So, unia is a word, but you know, I'm more about tachypnea and uh, verdipnea or dyspnea also known as SOB or apnea, which is no breathing. Um, do, do, do. Obstructive sleep apnea. Of course, there's an obstruction. It happens when I'm sleeping and then I'm not breathing efficiently. No breathing when I'm sleeping. And that's why these people with OSA or obstructive sleep apnea, oh, my sister used to have it. Oh, um, it's, called, it's called the spouse or partner test. If, if your snoring is so bad that it wakes up whoever is sleeping either next to, next, uh, next to you in bed or next door, uh, in the case of my sister, that's a problem. You have sleep apnea. And my sister used to wake up like groggy, like she didn't, uh, uh, like she didn't sleep at all. And um, also, you could also have obstructive sleep apnea, secondary to obesity. Uh, when, I, I, when I was at my heaviest, Oh, um, uh, my wife used to make me sleep in the basement because it, my snoring was so bad. But then amazingly, you start losing weight. You start taking better care of yourself, uh, better posture when you're sleeping. Look that up. Uh, all of that will improve. Or you can get a CPAP machine, which is a continuous positive airway pressure machine. But make sure you keep it clean. Run it through your UV. Um, uh, your, your UV. Uh, my nephew has this, and um, I remember uh, we used to keep him calling him Darth Vader when he was a baby. Not baby, but when he was like little like this. Now he's in his 20s, and I still call him Darth Vader. Uh, unia, see? 
Nia breathing, normal breathing, but yeah, it's not a really common word. Or thopnia. Oh, it's different kinds of breathing depending on your posture, especially uh, uh, with uh, obese patients. Um, there was a guy in the gym, he had a very, very big stomach, even bigger than mine. He was bending over to pick up weights, and I saw him, and he went down with like timber. He has or orthopnea. Um, and uh, I can even hear because he was pushing weight, you know, doing his exercise. Then he bent down to pick up the weight and, and the way his posture was, and he killed over. And then that made me go, oh, I got to work out some more. I got to keep to my diet. Last night, my family had pizza, but nope, I had my veggie tables. And I got to keep it, uh, keep the discipline uh, because uh, going surfing and I can't fit my wetsuit. That's never a good thing. And I'm not going to buy a new wetsuit. They're expensive. Oh, here is a thoracentesis. Thorax, centesis. Centesis is the suffix that means surgical puncture. Thora is the root of, of course, my thorax, or in this case, my lung. And you can see here, every time I see this, I remember. I always remember the day I, I poked the patient on the wrong side. I will never forget that day as long as I live. Diaphragm is that thin muscle that separates your abdominal cavity from your uh, chest cavity, uh, if you recall your anatomy and physiology. Mm, here's your diaphragm. So here's your chest cavity with your, your lung is here, you can see shaded. And you, I mean, your lung is here, but your heart's here. It's uh, this shaded thing behind all this muscle. And then here's your diaphragm. Acts like a bellows, acts like a, like a syringe drawing in air when you inhale. More about that when you're in anatomy and physiology. Pneumocystis carinae pneumonia or PCP. That's some really bad stuff. Pneumocystis carinae is a bacterial term, is a bacterial name. It's a bacteria, but it's a specific bacteria. You see PCP, glove up, mask up. It, um, the patient is highly infectious and the patient is highly immunocompromised. Uh, the patient probably has full-blown AIDS, nine times out of 10, or some, uh, or some sort of immune deficiency, and that's PCP. COPD, I mentioned earlier, um, this is COPD. It could be chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and or asthma. They're, they're all chronic, meaning it takes a long time, uh, and they're all pulmonary diseases of the lungs. So you can see emphysema, they have puffy and distended atelectasis or large alveoli, but asthma and bronchitis, everything gets stenotic, everything gets tight. Uh, and especially for asthma, you know, it has the classic wheezing. But a, a chronic bronchitis patient, when I had chronic bronchitis, I was wheezing just like any other asthmatic. And that's called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Do, 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 do. Here's some uh, abbreviations, which ones I like. Let's go from top to bottom. ABG, arterial blood gas, very, very common. And you future nurses, if you've had anatomy and physiology already, um, Start looking at videos of ABG for your future NCLEX and for your future pathology classes. AIDS, of course, that's easy. ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, very, very dangerous uh, because it happens very, very quickly. They get dyspnea like in hours and uh, it progresses, especially with babies, especially preemie babies. Um, CA, I've never heard it for anything else other than cancer or carcinoma. CF, cystic fibrosis nasty disease, osis, abnormal condition of fiber, and a lot of pus and a lot of cysts. And it gums up uh, your breathing process of your lungs. That, that means they have a lot of mucus. You gotta get it out. CO2, we already went over COPD, CPAP, where we went over. Sometimes I wanna look at your lungs, uh, use a CT scan, which is a computerized tomography. Tomo means location, graphy means the process of recording at specific location. It pretty much makes a 3D model based on um, serial slices uh, using x-rays. And that's what a CT is. So it has a decent amount of radiation. So 
uh, be aware of that as well. DP, your dip tech for DPT and I still know diagnosis. Hey, did I go over diagnosis versus prognosis? If not, let me do that again. Let's look at the word diagnosis. Uh, cis is your suffix, means state or condition. Dia is your prefix, which means uh, complete or thorough. And no is of course you're not uh, is the root and means knowledge. So in order to have a diagnosis, I must be in a state of complete or thorough knowledge. That means I have to have all my labs. I have to talk to every nurse and every doctor and every tech that's ever seen or touched you. Then I could give you a diagnosis. And, and that's why sometimes the doctor doesn't like talking to you because I don't want to tell you something that isn't locked down yet, even though I'm 80% sure that's, your, that's what you got. Now, but what's a prognosis? It's the same exact thing, but the prefix is pro. And the pro means before. So state or condition of before knowledge, that means it's a prediction. I don't know, things could change. Uh, that's why I find it very silly when people tell me the story, the doctor told me I could never walk again, but I can walk. You know, ooh, these stupid medical professionals. The doctor never said that to you. The doctor probably said the prognosis for you walking is poor, right? Um, uh, oh, they said I was going to die. No, the prognosis was poor. The odds are, if we don't fix this, that, and the other thing, you're going to die, right? Or you can't walk or this can't, kind of, but it's a prediction based on what? Not the full picture. Um, here's a classic example. How many times I've had breast cancer patients, um, they got a lumpectomy, we took the, oh, oh, we took the cancer out. And they're, they're, the very next day, they're like, oh, I don't have to go back to the doctor because I'm a cancer survivor. No, you're not. The prognosis for um, a single mass greater than three centimeters is there is a, something like a 60% chance that you will get cancer again within the next five to 10 years. So the patient must be diligent. But how many times I've had patients, they found another lump and they, they ignore it because they say, I'm a survivor. I beat it once. I'm going to beat it again. Hello? You got it again. So the prognosis is a prediction. And I, I can't predict the future, but many times I'm going to have to try because we want to try to prevent bad things that will happen in the future. So what kind of question could I ask about diagnosis? I could ask you, what's the definitive? What's the, you know, the, your, your definitive diagnosis, right? And the abbreviation is capital D with an X. That means it's my state of complete or thorough knowledge. But if I have something like this, DDX, which is my differential, that means it's things that I have to investigate. Also, you'll see the, this, word, this as well, rule out. A like, uh, classic example is I had a 14-year-old 14 14 female patient with right upper quadrant pain. Now, odds are it's appendicitis. Okay, she had a mild fever, then uh, had that, you know, female, 13, 14 years of, of age, odds are that's what it is, right? Now, before I even do the ultrasound or do other things or do the clinical stuff to confirm that it's AP, also known as appendicitis, I have to see, is it pregnancy, uh, torsion of the uterus, um, a whole bunch of things, cancer? I have to rule out. So I have a DDX or a differential. And I love telling this story. One time the differential was pregnancy. 13 year old girl, it is in an urban atmosphere. She claimed no, uh, no sexual partners. She claims that the young man who's waiting in the, um, uh, in the waiting room was not a boyfriend, but they're best friends. Oh, that's my best friend. Okay, so I was like, okay, whatever but I have to run on data. So of course, the father got bent out of shape when he saw on my differential, I wrote R slash O pregnancy. Oh, my daughter's pure. My daughter is a good girl. Uh, she would never do anything. Guess what? Was it appendicitis? No, she was pregnant. And that's where was the pain coming from. So differential, you have to check and investigate a whole bunch of things. And 
this, the diagnosis, prognosis, and different differential diagnosis and rule outs, that is why the doctor has to go to school for 16 years. Because remember, diagnosis, state or condition of complete and thorough knowledge. The MD is the person who gets everybody's stuff and puts it all together. And if I get it wrong, or if the doctor gets it wrong, then the management's gonna be wrong. Then all the work that you, you do to help the patient will be for nothing. So remember those words, remember what they really mean, really mean. EEG versus ECG. EEG is an electroencephalogram, that's for your brain. Remember, the gram is the actual recording. Graphy is what you, is the actual procedure. Remember, if it ends in Y, odds are it's procedure. Endotracheal tube or ET tube, you have an NGT tube, NG tube, which is nasogastric. We already talked about that one. Bicarbonate, uh, FVC and all that, your forced vital capacity, those are your lung volumes. Don't need to know that uh, until you're, you know, you take your med surge classes, uh, and then have to memorize all the lung volumes for, um, um, uh, for your NCLEX. Heart failure, yeah, that's common. MRI, common, nice. NMT, eh, not common. OSA, semi-common. This, PCO2, PACO2, PCO2, that's your partial pressure of carbon dioxide. It can be written this way. And it's also, uh, if it's O2, it's of course partial pressure of oxygen. And all these things will be relayed in your arterial blood gas, which is a test, you know, a blood test that we do for our uh, pulmonology patients. PFT, pulmonary function test. pH is how acidic or how alkaline or basic something is. pH, PSG, and nice to know. Sat, saturation means how much of that gas, whether it's oxygen or carbon dioxide is um, uh, in your blood. So O2 sat, which is your oxygen saturation, CO2 sat, which is your carbon dioxide saturation. But we're most, most likely regarding lab tests, O2 sat is uh, what I'm most likely looking at. SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome. Uh, there's a genetic component, and that's also the reason why you shouldn't let babies sleep on their stomach, that kind of thing. Um, me, my professional opinion, I believe it's genetic slash neurologic. Uh, that's why it explains the acute uh, and rather dramatic, horrible uh, um, um, way it uh, develops. SOB, shortness of breath, TB, tuberculosis. That's the beautiful thing now why everyone's wearing masks all around the world. TB around the world has decreased significantly because everyone's walking around with a mask. And if you have tuberculosis, that's how it spreads. It spreads uh, uh, airborne contagion. Acidosis, abnormal condition of acid. ARDS, we already talked about. Anoxia, state of condition of with or without oxygen versus hypoxia. Right? Uh, empyema, that's pus. You know, that's a common term. Also known as pyothorax. It's a more uh, formal term, but if you hear your patient has empyema, um, they have pleurisy, they also have pyothorax. They have, um, uh, your covering of your lungs, your pleura is in two layers. And in, uh, in between the two layers, you could have a whole bunch of pus. Epistaxis is a fancy term for nosebleed. Hypoxemia, hypoxia, influenza, which is the flu. Just remember, not even a hundred years ago, people used to die of just the normal flu, which by the way, is also a coronaviridae, part of the corona uh, family uh, of viruses. Uh, pneumothorax, not a good thing. Uh, means I've got air in my lungs and it'll collapse my lungs. So normally I'm like that, but if I stabbed you, put a hole in you or maybe shot you here, and then it connected, uh, this lung pressures to the outside world, your lungs will collapse and that's not a good thing. Bronchoscope. Yeah. Bronchoscopy is the procedure. Bronchoscope is the actual 
um, machine that they use. And it's neat, these wires go onto a TV. We can look at the TV, we can send it, we can email the video to, uh, to specialists, a whole bunch of things. Polysomnography, uh, this is called a sleep study. And it's also used for people who have obstructive sleep apnea. Spirometry, that's those lung volumes that I was talking to you about. Um, and you make them breathe into a machine and uh, you know the pulmonologist uses it to diagnose certain things. Or we use it to see if maybe is your bronchitis getting better? Is your COPD getting better? Um, we also use a, a more uh, primitive uh, spirometer, you know, the one, uh, this one, show you. You ever see this one? For any of you who had surgery, we use that to measure uh, your lung capacity and to see if you're recovering well from your surgery post-operatively. Uh, and then, you know, you have to do this like three times a day, maximum output and all that stuff. You'll learn that if you don't know that already. I use the slang blade. This is intubation. This is a blade, right? It's an oropharyngeal blade. Sometimes we use something called the OPA or oropharyngeal airway as a blade. Open that, and then we could put this uh, uh, intubation tube into their trach. Then we uh, inflate this to secure it, tape it down. Then we can give uh, oxygen therapy right directly to the lungs. And we do that if the patient's unconscious or if there's any obstruction here. We can give medications, bronchodilators, uh, increased airflow for a COPD patient, corticosteroids. Remember I mentioned, um, what do you call that? Uh, that bronchitis inflammation or infection. What's a great way to get that inflammation down? Uh, also in uh, really uh, bad uh, cases of asthma, we use steroids corticosteroids. The problem is, if I use a corticosteroid, especially a strong one, uh, you're going to be immunocompromised and you're going to get, uh, you're going to get a whole bunch of other problems. Mucolytics are anything that liquefies the sputum, but I don't like mucolytics. I like water, make the patient drink water. Here's a nebulizer, right? Learn all of that. Let's see anything else? And then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, the cases at the very area. And there's nice words here that you could, uh, that you could uh, see and use. And here's another one. And then they tell you all the nice, nice words. That's good. And here's some samples of some questions. All righty. It is at this point of the show. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, then take any questions.